And this one is actually going to be a poetry book. So um, when I say poetry book, it just means that like this book is written um, where each chapter or each section she has is kind of like a little mini poem. They all vary in length, um, but all together this is a memoir of this person's life. So a lot of you have probably heard of this book. This book is called um, Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. Um, so this is a New York Times bestseller. It's a National Book Award winner, a Coretta Scott King Award winner. This has a lot of accolades and it actually is not even that old. It's only like, I think it was published like 2014, I believe. So um, it's pretty new. Um, I was super excited to get my hands on this because um, anyone who knows me closely, um, including my students, knows that I love, love, love poetry. So any times I can uh, get my hands on it or uh, use it as a resource to teach my students, I do. Um, before I get into the book, I did want to give a small business shout out um, with this shirt. I thought it was appropriate for the times because um, as all Texas teachers know at least, um, we've uh, just gotten news um, about like TEA guidelines for the upcoming school year. And I know we have a lot of um, kind of worried and stressed teachers right now. So this shirt says, may your coffee be strong and your students be calm. So anybody who knows me well knows that this shirt fits me perfectly. Um, so any of you guys um, who might be interested in something like this, um, the boutique I got it from, if you're any of my Texas teachers, um, is the boutique called Black Daisy. And um, when I got this shirt, they were actually located really closely in Belton to me. Um, but now they've relocated to Waco and they make so much cute stuff. So um, if you have not given them um, a look, I would highly recommend them, um, especially because our small boutiques, our small businesses really need um, all of the um, business that they can get. So I'm gonna give them a small business shout out. Um, all right, so Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. Um, you can look up a little bit more about it if you'd like to, but basically this is a memoir of Jacqueline, Jackie Woodson's life. Um, and all it describes it as is an award-winning author, Jacqueline Woodson, shares her childhood growing up as an African-American in the 1960s and 1970s. Touching and powerful, her story is both accessible and emotionally charged, each line a glimpse into a child's soul as she searches for her place in the world. And I did want to read one review from the New York Times book review because I thought it really captured like how this book made me feel and why it's important to read this book or use this as uh, possibly a classroom resource. I personally do not plan to use um, the whole book as a classroom resource, like to read the book entirely. I think it would be really beneficial for students to pick out excerpts of this book um, because they're all basically individualized poems. They do go chronologically but I still think that you could use it as a classroom resource with individual poems because they all have their own um, kind of message to give. So I think it would be okay to take some of them um, out of order and to use them really just to teach students about um, either like a comparison to a, a nonfiction text or another book that they're reading just to kind of like side by side and um, analyze together. But I also think it would be good just to analyze uh, writing in general because she writes so beautifully. So the New York Times book review says the triumph of brown girl dreaming is not just in how well Woodson tells the story of her life, but in how elegantly she writes words that make us want to hold those carefully crafted poems close, apply them to our lives, reach into the mirror she holds up and make the words and the worlds she explores our own. This is a book full of poems that cry out to be learned by heart. These are poems that will, for years to come, be stored in our bloodstream. So obviously they considered this book to be something that could go on um, for a long time, and I think so too. Um, I, I, the poems that I've selected to read today, I picked about nine poems, um, and I feel like these are ones that not only translated during her time growing up or her time when she wrote this, but it still continues today and it still continues to be an important message, especially to teach our um, students or just for anybody in general to know about. 
So I'm going to read each one. Um, this book is arranged into separate parts. At the beginning, she actually gives a breakdown of her family tree, which is cool. So like you can kind of follow along with her story, but she also gives us um, the breakdown table of contents for the different parts. So there's five parts in all. And I love the name of the separate parts, um, especially the last one is called Ready to Change the World, which I absolutely love because that's where I actually picked most of my poems that I'm selecting to read and ones that I would definitely teach my students because obviously that message, Ready to Change the World, is something, especially in my class at least, that I really want to perpetuate to my students is that their words can change the world. And she really, really highlights that in all of her writing. So, all right. First poem is called Hope. Her brother's name is Hope, so this kind of plays obviously like a, a double meaning. Hope. The South doesn't agree with my brother. The heat sandpapers his skin. Don't scratch, my grandmother warns, but he does, and the skin grows raw beneath his fingers. The pollen leaves him puffy-eyed. His small breaths come quick, have too much sound around them. He moves slow, sickly now, where once he was strong. And when his body isn't betraying him, Ohio does. The memories waking him in the night, the view from my father's shoulders, the wonder of the Nelsonville house, the air so easy to breathe. You can keep yourself, my father had said. Now hope stays mostly quiet, unless asked to speak. His head bent inside the superhero comic books my grandfather brings home on Fridays. Hope searches for himself inside their pages, leaves them dog-eared by Monday morning. The South, his mortal enemy. The South, his kryptonite. All right. And then my second one, let me get my place here, is called South Carolina at War. Because we have a right, my grandfather tells us, we are sitting at his feet and the story tonight is why people are marching all over the South. To walk and sit and dream wherever we want. First they brought us here, then we worked for free. Then it was 1863, and we were supposed to be free, but we weren't. And that's why people are so mad. And it's true, we can't turn on the radio without hearing about the marching. We can't go to downtown Greenville without seeing the teenagers walking into stores, sitting where brown people still aren't allowed to sit and getting carried out, their bodies limp, their faces calm. This is the way brown people have to fight, my grandfather says. You can't just put your fist up. You have to insist on something, gently. Walk toward a thing, slowly. But be ready to die, my grandfather says, for what is right. Be ready to die, my grandfather says, for everything you believe in. And none of us can imagine death, but we try to imagine it anyway. Even my mother joins the fight. When she thinks our grandmother isn't watching, she sneaks out to meet the cousins downtown. But just as she's stepping through the door, her good dress and gloves on, my grandmother says, now don't go get getting arrested. And mama sounds like a little girl when she says, I won't. More than a hundred years, my grandfather says, and we're still fighting for the free life we're supposed to be living. So there's a war going on in South Carolina. And even as we play and plant and preach and sleep, we are a part of it. Because you're colored, my grandfather says, and just as good and bright and beautiful and free as anybody, and nobody colored in the South is stopping, my grandfather says, until everybody knows what's true. All right, and the third poem is called American Dream. Even when my girls were little, we'd go down there, my grandmother tells us, and people would be marching. The marching didn't just start yesterday. Police with those dogs scared everybody near death. Just once, I let my girls march. My grandmother leans back in her brown chair, her feet still in the Epsom salts water, her fingers tapping out, some silent tune. She closes her eyes. I let them, and I prayed. What's the thing, I ask her, that would make people want to live together? People have to want it, that's all. We get quiet. Maybe all of us are thinking about the ones who want it, and the ones who don't. We all have the same dream, my grandmother says to live equal in a country that's supposed to be the land of the free. She lets out a long breath, deep remembering. When your mother was little, she wanted a dog, but I said no. Quick as you can blink, I told her, a dog will turn on you. 
So my mother brought kittens home, soft and purring inside of empty boxes, meowing and meowing until my grandmother fell in love and let her keep them. My grandmother tells us all this as we sit at her feet, each story like a photograph. We can look right into, see our mothers there, marchers and dogs and kittens all blending, and us now, there in each moment beside her. And the next poem is called Stevie and Me. Every Monday, my mother takes us to the library around the corner. We are allowed to take out seven books each. On those days, no one complains that all I want are picture books. Those days, no one tells me to read faster, to read harder books, to read like Dell. No one is there to say, not that book, when I stop in front of the small paperback with a brown boy on the cover, Stevie. I read. One day, my mama told me, you know, you're going to have a little friend come stay with you. And I said, who is it? If someone had been fussing with me to read like my sister, I might have missed the picture book filled with brown people, more brown people than I'd ever seen in a book before. The little boy's name was Steven, but his mother kept calling him Stevie. My name is Robert, but my mama don't call me Roberti. If someone had taken that book out of my hand, said, you're too old for this, maybe, I'd never have believed that someone who looked like me could be in the pages of the book that someone who looked like me had a story. The next one's called What Everybody Knows Now. Even though the laws have changed, my grandmother still takes us to the back of the bus when we go downtown in the rain. It's easier, my grandmother says, than having white folks look at me like I'm dirt. But we aren't dirt. We are people, paying the same fare as other people. When I say this to my grandmother, she nods, says, easier to stay where you belong. I look around and see the ones who walk straight to the back, see the ones who take a seat up front, daring anybody to make the move. And now this is who I want to be, not scared like that, brave like that. Still, my grandmother takes my hand downtown, pulls me right past the restaurants that have to let us sit wherever we want now. No need in making trouble, she says. You all go back to New York City, but I have to live here. We walk straight past Woolworths without even looking in the windows because the one time my grandmother went inside, they made her wait and wait, acted like I wasn't even there. It's hard not to see the moment. My grandmother in her Sunday clothes, a hat with a flower pinned to it, neatly on her head, her patent leather purse, perfectly clasped between her gloved hands, waiting quietly long past her turn. The next one's called Power to the People. On the TV screen, a woman named Angela Davis is telling us there's a revolution going on and that it's time for black people to defend themselves. So Maria and I walk through the streets, our fists raised in the air Angela Davis style. We read about her in the daily news, run to the television each time she's interviewed. She is beautiful and powerful and has my same gap tooth smile. We dream of running away to California to join the Black Panthers, the organization Angela is a part of. She is not afraid, she says, to die for what she believes in, but doesn't plan to die without a fight. The FBI says Angela Davis is one of America's most wanted. Already, there are so many things I don't understand. Why? Why would someone have to die or even fight for what they believe in? Why the cops would want someone who is trying to change the world in jail. We are not afraid to die. Maria and I shout fist high for what we believe in. But both of us know we'd rather be keep on believing and live. The next one is called The Revolution. Don't wait for your school to teach you, my uncle says, about the revolution. It's happening in the streets. He's been out of jail for more than a year now, and his hair is in an afro again, gently moving in the wind as we head to the park, him holding tight, to my hand even when we're not crossing. Knickerbocker Avenue, even now when I'm too old for a hand holding and the like. The revolution is when Shirley Chisholm ran for president, and the rest of the world tried to imagine a black woman in the White House. When I hear the word revolution, I think of the carousel with all those beautiful horses going around us as though they'll never stop and me 
choosing the purple one each time, climbing up into it and reaching for the golden ring, as soft music plays. The revolution is always going to be happening. I want to write this down, that the revolution is like a merry-go-round, history always being made, somewhere, and maybe for a short time, we're a part of that history. And then the ride stops and our turn is over. We walk slow towards the park where I can always see the big swings, empty and waiting for me. And after I write it down, maybe I'll end it this way. My name is Jacqueline Woodson and I am ready for the ride. All right, the next one is called A Rider. You're a rider, Miss Vivo says, her gray eyes bright behind the wire frames. Her smile bigger than anything, so I smile back, happy to hear these words from a teacher's mouth. She is a feminist, she tells us, and 30 fifth grade hands bend into desks where our dictionaries wait to open yet another world to us. Miss Vivo pauses, watches our fingers fly, Webster's has our answers. Equal rights, a boy named Andrew yells out, for women. My hands freeze on the thin white pages. Like blacks, Miss Vivo too is part of a revolution. But right now, that revolution is so far away from me. This moment, this here, this right now. My teacher is saying, you're a writer. As she holds the poem, I am just beginning. The first four lines stolen from my sister. Black brothers, black sisters, all of them were great. No fear, no fright, but a willingness to fight. You can have them, Dell said when she saw. I don't want to be a poet. And then my own pencil moving late into the evening. In big fine houses lived the whites, and little old shacks lived the blacks. But the blacks were smart, in fear they took no part. One of them was Martin, with a heart of gold. You're a writer, Miss Vivo says, holding my poem out to me. And standing in front of the class, taking my poem from her, my voice shakes as I recite the first line. Black brothers, black sisters, all of them were great. But my voice grows stronger with each word because more than anything else in the world, I want to believe her. All right, and then the last poem is called Each World. When there are many worlds, you can choose the one you walk into each day. You can imagine yourself brilliant as your sister, slower moving, quiet and thoughtful as your older brother, or filled up with the hiccuping joy and laughter of the baby in the family. You can imagine yourself a mother now, climbing onto a bus at nightfall, turning to wave goodbye to your children, watching the world of the South Carolina disappear behind you. When there are many worlds, love can wrap itself around you. Say, don't cry. Say, you are as good as anyone. Say, keep remembering me. And you know, even as the world explodes around you, that you are loved. Each day, a new world opens itself up to you, and all the worlds you are. Ohio and Greenville, Woodson and Irby, Gunner's Child and Jack's Daughter, Jehovah's Witness and Non-Believer, Listener and Writer, Jackie and Jacqueline. Gather into one world called you, where you decide what each world and each story and each ending will finally be. All right, so those are the nine poems that um, I selected to read from this. Um, and then I'm gonna also read you guys the author's note because I always feel like the author's note is relevant and I always feel like it's something that just kind of solidifies um, what each book is about. I also think it's cool that she inserts all these photographs of her family in the back of like growing up so that you can put a face to a name. Um, because of all those poems that she has about her family. Um, but I think um, out of the poems that I chose, like hopefully it's clear like why this is still important today, even though it was talking about during the times where um, people were fighting for their civil rights, which is not really just a piece of history. It's something that's still occurring today. So um, that easily translates into stuff that's going on right now. Here's the author's note. Memory is strange. When I first began to write Brown Girl Dreaming, my childhood memories of Greenville came flooding back to me. Small moments and bigger ones too. Things I hadn't thought about in years and other stuff I've never forgotten. When I began to write it all down, 
I realized how much I missed the South. So for the first time in many years, I returned home and saw cousins I hadn't seen since I was small, heard stories I had heard many times from my grandmother, walked roads that were very different now, but still the same roads in my childhood. It was a bittersweet journey. I wish I would have walked those roads again with my mom, my grandfather, my uncle Robert, my aunt Kay, and my grandmother. But all have made their own journey to the next place. So I walked the roads alone this time. Still, it felt as though each of them was with me. They're all deeply etched now into my memory. And that's what this book is. My past, my people, my memories, my story. I knew I couldn't write about the South without writing about Ohio. And even though I was only a baby when we lived there, I have the gift of my amazing Aunt Ada Adams, who is a genealogist and our family historian. She was my go-to person and filled in so many gaps in my memory. Aunt Ada took me right back to Columbus. During the writing of this book, I returned to Ohio with my family. Aunt Ada took us on a journey of the Underground Railroad, showed us the graves of grandparents and great-grandparents, told me so much history I had missed out on as a child. Aunt Ada not only showed me the past, but she helped me understand the present. So often I am asked where my stories come from. I know now that my stories are part of a continuum. My aunt is a storyteller. So were my mom and my grandmother. In the history Aunt Ada showed me, the rich history that is my history, made me at once proud and thoughtful. The people who came before me worked so hard to make this world a better place for me. I know my work is to make the world a better place for those coming after. As long as I can remember this, I can continue to do the work I was put here to do. On the journey to writing this book, my dad, Jack Woodson, chimed in when he could. Even as I write this, I smile because my father always makes me laugh. I'd like to think I acquired a bit of this sense of humor. I didn't know him for many years. When I met him again at the age of 14, it was as though a puzzle piece had dropped from the air and landed right where it belonged. My dad is that puzzle piece. Gaps were also filled in by my friend Maria, who helped the journey along with pictures and stories. When we were little, we used to say we'd one day be old ladies together, sitting in rocking chairs remembering our childhood and laughing. We've been friends for nearly five decades now and still call each other my forever friend. I hope everyone has a forever friend in their life. But at the end of the day, I was alone with Brown Girl Dreaming, walking through those memories and making sense out of myself as a writer in a way I had never done before. I am often asked if I had a hard time growing up. I think my life was very complicated and very rich. Looking back on it, I think my life was at once ordinary and amazing. I couldn't imagine any other life. I know that I was lucky to be born during a time when the world was changing like crazy and that I was a part of that change. I know that I was and continue to be loved. I couldn't ask for anything more. So that last part that she says about um, being born during a crazy or being born during a time when the world was changing like crazy and wanting to be part of that change, I think that that point right there is a main reason why I would want to use this as a classroom resource because I would want my students to see that this is obviously a time where the world is changing like crazy and like don't think that your dreams or your ideas are you know too small to bring to the forefront because this is a time when we're really listening. It's a time where um, people are able to share their ideas and people are actually paying attention and so I think that would be kind of like a good segue into like, this is not just something that happened in the past, it's something that's still happening today. Um, so I have a few other books that are diversity books. And then um, once I finish with those, then I'll get back to some more like um, pleasure reading books, like all of my like fantasy and dystopian and stuff like that. Um, I have really enjoyed doing this project so far. I think that I've gotten a lot of great reads out there. Um, I'm really happy about the ones that I'm adding to my classroom library because I think a lot of these have really good points um, for my middle school learners. Um, and I did want to ask again, like if you know of any titles that I haven't talked about yet um, that you want to bring up that sound kind of similar to something I've already done or something that you really think that I would benefit from. I would love for you to comment that underneath or send me a message um, and let me know which ones that you would like to hear more about. Um, I still have some big ones coming up like uh, The Hate You Give and stuff like that so I'll be doing like book reviews for some of those um, just because uh, like Dear Martin that I did 
a couple days ago. Uh, some of them just have a little bit too much language or like serious content um, for my middle school readers to technically read like in class as a resource, but I still want to give like honest reviews of books that I really liked because I still want to share them out there as a resource of something that um, you might be interested in. So if you watch this video, thank you for watching. Um, make sure to like give me some ideas or comment on books that you really, really liked or anything like that. Um, and then I will be back next week, probably on Tuesday, hopefully on Tuesday, um, to for the next one. Alright, thank you for watching. Bye.